It hurts. I'm sure of that. I'm wincing and tears stream down my face and I can't make eye contact with my mother because it feels wrong to be so hurt in front of her. I'm 21 years old, fresh off a flight from Central America and exhausted from weeks of insomnia and crippling morning sickness. My doctor is a sing-songy Upper East Side OBGYN with I think blonde hair and almost certainly a graduation with distinction to be practicing in such a prestigious hospital. It doesn't hurt, she says. It shouldn't hurt. She chatters at me about literally the weather while scraping the inside of my uterus with what in my mind was a large cheese knife, one that would guarantee I wasn't pregnant anymore. If only it had been a baby dragon or a goat. I could have just squatted in a pen, maybe in a friend's backyard in upstate New York, and visited on weekends. <laughs> but humans are more complicated. And for a human to make a human life more complicated still. And it wasn't part of the plan. Not that I had a specific plan at 21, but the vague, white, middle-class suburban person plan to graduate college, be very, very important, and not have a baby in Guatemala with a divorced 40-year-old bartender. Sweet as he was, because I almost only chose the sweet boys, except for that odd one or two who threatened to take my life. Those were very different days for me in some ways, but if you would assume that a gay girl has never needed an abortion, you just may be mistaken. Life is long. So I don't feel like using a condom one afternoon. Well, multiple afternoons, but this one in particular. And then three days later, I find out what it means to get in touch with my body. I'm walking down the street, and I feel a shiver-inducing ding inside of me, like receiving a crush's text message. Oh, hi, hello, you're pregnant. <laughs> and I knew. I was wearing a tight red tank top, flea market jeans, and $5 Velcro sneakers. No makeup, no effort. But in those days, I regularly received marriage proposals in the street. As ambivalent as I was about men, they were universally enthusiastic about me. Maybe next time I would say yes. Maybe my old life would forget me. I called home to say I was pregnant because and only because I could not afford to buy my plane ticket home. I had been in Guatemala for six months with no plan to return, ever. Now facing the reality of abortion being illegal here. I frantically internet research and message board comment seeking a way, any way, to get an abortion in Guatemala or Mexico. But if it exists, I don't have the connections to find it. The fear was what I imagine a bird feels just before it realizes it's headed straight into a plate of glass. Knowing, but too late, and no turns to make. How? Pregnant are you, my mother demands, when she isn't getting any straight answers out of me. <laughs> I'm upstairs at that same internet cafe, paying to make a five-minute international phone call. It's been six weeks. Six weeks of crying and praying in bed and telling wild lies, drinking cheap vodka and making my body a generally inhospitable place, even for myself. Not very, I mumble, my face hot with shame. Good, when can you leave? I ride the rattly chicken bus the 45 minutes outside of town to say goodbye to my students, a group of homeless boys who make felt and glitter art projects with me at the end of their work day as shoeshine boys are market attendants. I cross the gate and they run to me, press their faces against my thigh or my hands. My skin is a vacation in their already long 10-year-old lives. I may be a Jezebel and called a slut 
more times in my life than I could ever possibly count. But in addition to being those things, thank you. <laughs> in addition <laughs> to being those things, I am also the softest, sweetest place in the entire universe to rest your head. There is something in my softness that has the power to make you believe there is such a thing as safety. And these small boys who could barely remember their mothers like to be close to me, to the deeply feminine hum of my presence and the gentle way I touch their faces. I lived for them and I guess they could feel it. I stand in this dirt yard and hug them, kiss the bridge of their nose and say goodbye. To anyone else in town, I was just a person who disappeared one day. New York looks like an alien village in the dark, beneath me, flying into LaGuardia at night. My parents pick me up, smiling. Once we're inside their old Volvo, in complete silence, my mother in the passenger seat and me tucked in the back, my father lifts his eyes to the rearview mirror and says, your mother had an abortion years ago after Johnny. We would have had a fourth baby. I wanted it, of course, but your mom didn't. She just couldn't. Things like this happen. He looks to my mother whose face I can't see and she adds, it's nothing bad. I just went home and lay down the rest of the day. Now, no one in my family had ever admitted anything to me. As far as I knew, I was the catalyst for all catastrophe, the professional mistake maker. And now, the holy grail of acceptance is being extended to me, casually, backs turned, just me facing forward in the middle seat into the dark future double yellow lines hurtling. My mother silently holds my hand during this whole cheese knife debacle. She closes her eyes and squeezes tight, but I know her well enough that it's actually the doctor's cheery small talk making her cringe. God, we hated each other back then. The words we screamed should never be repeated, not even into a black hole. But I remember the way she held my hand that day. It's what it means to me to show up for someone, still. So this doctor is tone deaf talking at me and I am fucking angry. I think it's rude. And I'm seething over her rudeness that she doesn't care, I'm in pain. And then it creeps in that I'm failing as a radical feminist because in addition to my anger, there is a distinct sadness surfacing in this sterile office. I mean, even now, I don't feel comfortable telling you I was sad. You may take that revelation and betray my confidence, decide there is some moral question to answer, one I don't believe in or ask. But then why the Fuck was I sad if this all meant nothing, if it was just the same as going to the dentist. I hated my sadness and yours. There is an intense pressure that abortion be a giant nothing to those of us who know it is our right, because to everyone else, it is such a tragedy. On our side of things, there can't be feelings. It's one or the other. My doctor desperately needed this to be routine, emotionless, chatty, happy, that I be capable of that in a paper gown with my legs spread, freezing, and so confused about everything that had ever happened to me. There wasn't a lot of space for me in that room. When would there be a space, an actual space for all of me? for the Kristeva reading former ballerina semi-snob who also liked to fuck strangers in alleyways, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and <laughs> and who would come out as the most super gay, sparkly unicorn 
only to immediately sleep with 15 dudes because don't fucking ever tell me what to do. <laughs> but in all honesty, I might not have turned down a chance to fit somewhere had it ever been offered. So when I made that phone call to this Guatemalan bartender who had mostly been so sweet to me, whose name I can't include here because I literally don't remember it, <laughs> to tell him I'd had a miscarriage and I was sorry and we'd talk again soon, I hung up knowing that he'd never hear from me again and I'd change my email address and go back to my college in the Hudson River Valley woods and be safe again for a little while. I forgive that girl who made that phone call. She was smart enough to know how to save herself to face the next thing. I would go back and tell that doctor that my tears are okay, that they do not challenge her work or threaten the rightness of my choice because it's just always been this way for me, that my breathing and living another day is simple proof of paradox, and that should be enough.